This is about I uh, from Sharknet, uh, Western University. Uh, today uh, we're going to continue on the, uh, the series of topic on Julia, and this is the third part of uh, our uh, talk on the parallel computing uh, explained. Uh, what we're going to uh, cover today includes the following: a quick review of what's covered in the previous talk and uh, automatic uh, parallelization in linear algebra operations and parallel and distributed computing. And uh, lastly, uh, we're going to run a short example on a Computer Canada system, how to uh, run uh, Julia in, uh, uh, on multiple uh, processes in parallel. Uh, what's not covered, uh, we're not going to cover uh, much for threaded computing, but uh, at the very end, I'll uh, mention a uh, uh, two slides uh, about the threaded computing uh, support in Julia. And uh, we're not going to cover uh, MPI uh, and others, uh, which uh, is being uh, supported, but we're not going to cover it today. So a quick uh, review. Now, Julia is available for Windows, uh, Linux, and uh, Mac OS. Uh, it is available on uh, SharkNet and the Computer Canada systems. If you go on to uh, any of the Computer Canada systems and you do a log, open the terminal and the module load the GCC 7.3 and then load the Julia 1.3 and then start a Julia with this option uh, dash P4 or whatever a number not greater than uh, A, I would say. Then you will enter the Julia environment. This, so if you want, you can uh, try all the things and follow what I what I talk. And the Julia has a rich programming and language support, and it's support for a, a parallel programming a paradigm uh, through underlying MPI libraries, and also it support uh, linear algebra uh, operations with uh, threading, multi-threading enabled. And as well, it supports data frames, which is a big uh, thing for data analytic and uh, big data. And it is very fast compared to R, uh, Python, MATLAB, and even the compiler languages such as C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, a quick uh, review, you can, uh, you, you can take a look at the slides we posted in, in the past. Uh, uh, you will see uh, more details, but here uh, I just quickly uh, mentioned two uh, extra things. Uh, one is the structure uh, supported by Julia. You can define the structure. For example, a person uh, includes a name and ID. And then I create a, <coughs> uh, an empty array uh, called a person, and then I'm calling a push to add uh, uh, persons to uh, the array. And on the right-hand side, if I type this uh, array people, and then they will list uh, the array elements. So that, uh, that's how we, <coughs> uh, this is an example of how we use the structure. And as well, I want to just point out the dictionary, uh, which is basically as a pair of the key and values. Uh, this is a very useful uh, as well. Uh, not much useful for <coughs> numerical, uh, computation, but useful for general uh, purpose computing. Uh, here um, is an example. I'm creating a dictionary uh, with A and a B, and then I uh, uh, add a, a, a third element, a C. And so that is how you do it. If I call it a, a merge, then you can you can add a new item to the existing dictionary. Okay. Uh, uh, what you uh, see here is just a quick uh, a review of what the, the array operations that uh, uh, Julia supports, and this is a comparison. That's basically, this is a cheat sheet. Um, the Julia support uh, array operations as MATLAB, R, and other uh, languages such as Fortran. And you can filter out uh, some elements from the arrays, and you can just take a subarrays from uh, an array uh, with a very, very handy you know, operations. For example, if you want to return an a subarray of all elements greater than a B, and this is how you do it uh, in MATLAB, and how you do it in R, and how you do it in Julia. The difference between 
uh, MATLAB and R in Julia is you're going to put a dot operation uh, uh, <coughs> in front of the, the operator. Okay. Now, uh, let's quickly move to uh, uh, automatic uh, parallelization in linear uh, algebra uh, operations. Here is an example, uh, matrix vector uh, uh, operations. Le uh, Julia supports linear algebra uh, operations as MATLAB and uh, Python and R. It uses the underlying uh, math libraries, uh, <coughs> tuned uh, libraries such as OpenPlus and LayPack and, uh, and or in, in the case of Intel, and Intel MKL uh, libraries. Uh, what you see here is I create the three matrices A, B, and a C, and then you can just do a matrix matrix multiplication uh, using a C equals A times B. Now, if you want to speed up the, the process, if you want to do the matrix matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication in parallel, supported by the underlying uh, thread enabled libraries, what you can do is before you start Julia, at the command line, you set the environment variables, OMP and number threads equal to whenever, uh, whatever uh, number of uh, threads you want to use, but up to uh, the uh, number of uh, available uh, cores available on your system or on Computer Canada you know, system. And then you run it and see if you get performance gain. Okay, By increasing the number of threads, you should see the speed up. Okay, but uh, do not expand Julia threads. If you're using a linear algebra libraries with uh, threads enabled, do not expand uh, Julia threads. Uh, for solving linear systems, uh, if you have a matrix A right hand side uh, B, and you can just solve uh, the linear system with A slash B, that will return you the solution using whatever uh, appropriate uh, an algorithm for solving the linear system, whether uh, it's uh, LU decomposition or Chalisky uh, uh, factorization, depending on the, the type of the matrix, whether it's uh, symmetric, <laughs> positive, uh, definite, or not, or complex. And uh, Julia supports sparse uh, matrices as well. <clears throat> Here's an example. If the matrix A1 is constructed, as a sparse matrix, and then you can apply the same uh, linear algebra operations and the symbols to uh, to sparse uh, matrices as if they are uh, stored in the regular uh, storage. But this in this example on the right hand side, it, nobody will create a sparse matrix like this. You create a full matrix, and then you call sparse uh, unless the matrix is fairly small. You will construct your sparse matrix in different ways, and but. Once you have a sparse matrix, matrices, then you can use the, uh, the regular operations <coughs> on those uh, objects. Now, for parallel uh, computing, there are two approaches, uh, implicit versus uh, explicit. In the implicit approach, one spends a less effort, and there's no need to write ex uh, explicit uh, parallel code. And you can use the built-in libraries, uh, such as the uh, OpenBlast, uh, LayPack, ScalarPack, or Intel MKL library. And you will use uh, shared and the distributed data objects uh, supported by Julia. But the debugging, if anything goes wrong, the debugging is really because the, the parallelism is hand, all handled by those libraries. And there's nothing you can do about it. This is a hard boundary, and that's on the other side. Okay, but uh, with the implicit approach, uh, you spend the very uh, least effort to to get uh, to to have a, a much gain. For example, uh, for solving linear algebra problems, if the line, underlying linear algebra pro, uh, uh, libraries are thread enabled, then you can have <coughs> the benefit of parallel processing uh, immediately without even writing the parallel uh, code. Uh, sometimes for uh, a lot of people who want a direct control of the parallelism, um, then other people can write 
uh, parallel code, then that, that will require some extra effort. And you, of course, you have to know what you're do, uh, doing, <laughs> especially if you want to have a explicit control of data transfer through send and receive. These are the basic uh, parallel or concurrent programming uh, operations, and you have to know how to do it. And as well, for uh, explicit parallel uh, computing, and Julia supports one-sided communication through a put in the get operations. But again, uh, when it comes to debugging, uh, it might be challenging. Okay. Now uh, let's uh, uh, let's take a look at the, uh, how we can do a parallel and distributed computing with Julia. Now back to uh, the linear algebra uh, operations. As I mentioned, uh, for ex uh, implicit parallelism, for example, you're uh, doing a lot of linear algebra operations and you want to make use of a multi-cores or multi-threads, then uh, pretty much uh, uh, the, the li underlying libraries are uh, enabled, are capable of doing that. But see, uh, the, all you need to do is to set the number of the threads before you start the, the Julia. And then when, when, you, when you do the linear algebra operations, the underlying library will take care of a parallelism and the parallel processing uh, for you. You don't have to worry about that. So if that's all your work, that's all your work is like this, then you're done. Then you don't have to worry about the others. The rest of the, <clears throat> the talk will, uh, will be a little bit more uh, advanced. Okay, so uh, parallel computing with uh, Julia. Now we started with uh, multi-processes. At the end, the very end of the talk, we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, uh, talk briefly on threaded computing. For, multi, uh, for using the multi-processes, so basically we're running, we try to start uh, multiple instances of our program on multiple processes. So they can work together and work on a subset of the problems and to achieve the parallelism to, or the concurrency. Uh, this is how uh, you can start uh, Julia instances. Uh, left hand side, you start from command line. Uh, in this case, you, I start an uh, eight process by using Julia dash p eight, eight uh, processes. Or you specify a machine file on what nodes, on what machines you want to uh, you want to start uh, the Julia, and that's the two different ways. Or once you start a Julia within Julia, and you can call uh, the function add a process. In this case, for example, to add a additional processes, so that you will have a in general, including the the, the first one you you've already started. Uh, just uh, I want to give a, a warning that dynamically creating or increasing the number of processes is not recommended, and this is for all jobs, regardless of whether it's R, MATLAB. Uh, Python or other um, or any program written in any other uh, program languages on any system where the job scheduler controls. Okay. Now, for doing the multiple uh, multi-process uh, processing or parallel uh, computing, you need you need to broadcast all the values of variables to participating uh, processes. This is how we do in Julia. So we define one, two, three, four, five, and on all the uh, processes we call workers. Now the next line, if we define x zero is one uh, equal to one, two, three, four, five, the x zero is local variable, and if you call everywhere, this is how you do uh, how do you broadcast using everywhere. Everywhere x equal to x zero, x here you try to attempt to define the variable on every worker using uh, x zero, but x zero here is a reference. This reference is not available on other uh, other uh, workers, so this will fail. Instead, you will need copy 
a value. You need a, what you essentially need is you need a copy of the value uh, stored in the x zero and then define that uh, define the x with that value on other uh, other workers processes. Okay. Um, as well, uh, not only do you need the variables, the values, but all, uh, objects, but also you need the functions on other processes as well. Uh, this is how you do, uh, how do you uh, uh, broadcast or how you uh, start a function, define the functions on every uh, processes. On the left hand side, uh, we call the module, we load the module distributed, very important, is it distributed, that is a module uh, Julia uses for parallel computing. And I define the function, define the function, show ID, but this function is defined local. This function is not a, available everywhere. The content of the function is not available. So uh, if you call everywhere show ID, the show ID is just a reference to the function because the content of the function is not available on other processes. So this is not the right way. The right way is on the right hand side you would need to do everywhere function. You need to define a function everywhere so that the content uh, will become available available on um, other processes or everywhere as well. So remember, you want to use the everywhere and the statement executable to, uh, to ship everything to uh, other uh, places, including objects, value, uh, uh, variables, and the, function, the definition of the functions. Here's an example uh, of executing a procedure remotely. Um, so what we do here is we load a distributed module, load distributed module, and in the for loop here, a loop over all uh, the workers participating, all the, uh, the Julia uh, workers instances, and then I call the function spawn at. Spawn at is a, is a macro, is a function spawn at i, this is a worker i, spawn at i, and I want to execute the three functions, my id, uh, the process id, and the host name. I want to call these three functions, and then I will get the return uh, to get them the value returned to me, okay? This is how you do it. You want to use the fetch to get the return the values. Julia uses the concept of a future. Okay, there's a future. This might be a, <coughs> a foreign to many of us using the regular program languages, but uh, it is the concept is available on some other program languages such as uh, C++. So to run a procedure on, on the automatically chosen process, we call uh, spam and then the procedure, okay? If you want to call a procedure on a specific process and you do, you call the spawn at. And the both will return a value, which a handle called the future. In order to get the result, you call the function again, called a fetch, fetch uh, those futures back. The reason for that is you place the call spawn and the spawn at, they will return immediately. So what's happening is the future by future means, what's happening is the remote procedure, you place the, a call to the remote procedure and the completion of the remote procedure uh, might happen in the future time. So that's called the future. And in order to get that, uh, at the result, you call it again, fetch. And logically, a fetch will cause, uh, will place a, a wait uh, there until the remote procedure uh, is completed. Okay, uh, just a, a summary, spawn at, a spawn, and a spawn at. Okay, uh, this is a programming model that Julia uses, which is, might be, a, uh, which might be a different from uh, uh, like an MPI, or if you're familiar with, and uh, the, uh, the same program or multiple data uh, module, uh, model. So you always start everything on the main on the first one in, in red. And then once you want to get your work down, the pieces of a work or task down, then you, uh, you, uh, you dispatch 
the, the procedures by calling everywhere or spam or spam net on workers. Okay, so this is the model. This is the model that Julia uses. So tasks are dispatched and computed on workers. And the, this is more uh, much like a, the jobs are done on the computer, so you know, Shark and the Computer Canada systems. So uh, you, you should always keep this in mind. This is this model. You start with a domain uh, uh, with ID one, and your worker uh, processes are in, in in blue. You, always, you need to always think about who you are, who I am, who am I. In order to do this, uh, do the parallel processing. Uh, placing a remote call again, you can call a uh, function remote call. This is the same as the uh, spawn add, the spawn and the spawn add. Remote call, uh, the first one is the function you want to call, and the second argument is where, on what <coughs> worker or set of workers, and the last one is the, the variables, the argument. All right? And the remote call uh, is not blocking. It returns immediately and it returns the handle called the future. In order to get a result, you need to you need to call fetch to fetch the uh, uh, what's happening uh, on the future. And also, uh, we can combine the remote call and the fetch together. So make it as a blocking call. I place the call and wait. So this is the why we have a fetch. Oh, we have a remote underscore fetch. This is a combine. This combines the remote call and the fetch together. Uh, this is a blocking call. The remote call is non-blocking. Another uh, programming model quite uh, often used as a con producer consumer uh, model. Uh, Julia supports the the mechanism uh, called a channel, and you create a two channels, channel one and channel two. And then yeah, we define the function food, and with, within this function, this function is just a wrapper. Within this function, we are sitting in the infinite loop, and this loop does nothing but just pops a task off the queue, uh, off the channel one, by calling peak, and then it returns the data and, and the things. And then you, you process data, and once you're done, you want to put the, uh, the result back to channel two. So you, you call uh, put, that's all. And then on the right hand side, uh, to make this happen, we, we have this wrapper function foo uh, to, to execute this. Uh, we uh, just schedule n instances of a foo and then a call this function. We put the uh, <clears throat> macro asynchronous, uh, which means it doesn't really matter the order of the calls. Because this is a producer-consumer model, uh, the order doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, next, uh, let's take a look at a more realistic uh, mathematical uh, problem. Uh, we try to compute an approximation of a pie by counting the points uniformly uh, tossed inside uh, a, a quarter circle versus the total number of points over the unit square. Okay. So uh, the pi in this case is approximately four times of the ratio of a points that are fall inside or on the circle and versus the, uh, the total number of points that you tossed. So this is what we do. We, first, we create a function. We create a file. Uh, this is uh, what you do a program. You all, you, you always write the code in the file. A color, uh, we create a file called a pi underscore distributed. And then we create a function. This function is just count the number of points inside the circle. Uh, we loop over number of uh, points. This function takes uh, the input argument, the n, which is the number of a point, uh, to toss. And then we generate a random, uh, uh, uniformly ra uh, distributed random points, x and y, between the 0 and the 1. And just count if they fall into uh, fall inside or on the circle, then we just count. Uh, otherwise, we uh, ignore it. And they, this function will return the number of points inside. And the, uh, in the same file, we define a function wrapper that will compute the approximation of a pi in parallel. 
we call it a pi underscore p. So this function does, uh, it first, uh, it calls the number of workers. Uh, I need to know how many uh, participating workers are. And then, this is important, the next a for loop, the loop or loop over p, number of a p, a number of a workers. And then within this loop, I just call this function. Call the function on the left hand side, define the counting the number of points inside. And I, in front of the for loop, I put a distributed. I'm telling this, uh, the Julia now, this for loop, please do this for loop in a distributed fashion. So the Julia will distribute the for loop, will divide the for loop into pieces and distribute it among workers. And in the end, it will do a reduction on the operator plus. This is uh, the operator between distributed and the for loop. No, without uh, uh, this operate without this operator, it's not a deduction. It's just purely distributing uh, the, the the work within the loop. With the with with the reduction operator, you're not only uh, distributing the uh, the tasks uh, of the loop to workers, but also at the end uh, it will do a reduction. Okay, so. Uh, we have a number of workers, and then we divide the number of points, one of the total number of points uh, among the workers, and then calling the counting inside the circle point, and that's it. So at the end, it, this function wrapper will just return the approximation of a pi. Okay, so I think this is a pretty straightforward. Uh, again, just a, a quick uh, a summary, you want to use Distributed operator and procedure for reduction. You distributed the procedure across the nodes, and then finally you do a reduction. This is how we do uh, 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 on on the system. First, we need to start a number of uh, Julia instances. Okay, you need to start a Julia instance ahead of time, as I mentioned. And then inside the Julia, I can do this inside Julia and I load the distributed module. And then I distribute, distribute the function by calling everywhere include that, include the file. Because I define the functions inside that, the file, remember? And then once the file is loaded on every worker, I just simply call the function pi underscore p. This is the function wrapper, remember, this is a function wrapper. And I passed in the number of points, which is a one million. The Julia allows you to use the underscore to separate the numbers, so make the number more uh, clear. And then uh, just return the, the approximation of pi. Okay, that's an example. The next uh, example, uh, distributed arrays. Distributed array uh, is a mechanism that allows you to create an object that is uh, stored across uh, workers. And this is suitable for uh, people to handle large data sets that cannot fit on a single machine. So if you have a, a matrix uh, resulting from, from say, for, for example, finite element analysis that, uh, that include billions of finite elements that cannot, the resulting matrix cannot fit in the one single machine and using distributed arrays uh, can solve the problem. So in this example, process A, process A has the blue portion, uh, but it also has access to the other portions of the entire matrix simply uh, through uh, indices. By indexing, by using a, a global indexing, any process can access any data across all the pro, uh, uh, workers. This is the idea of the distributed arrays. So what we do, uh, first uh, we load the modules uh, distributed and distribute arrays, uh, distribute arrays. And then I uh, define, I use the three functions to define, to create the three uh, uh, blocks, blue, uh, 
uh, blue, a green, yellow, and uh, and the red. This is, this is three functions: so A, A, B, one, B, two. Uh, they are uh, the functions are used to create the local matrix. The portions are local matrices. Okay. And we want to create this uh, matrix A and distribute it on uh, on four processors on the two by two grid. This is what we want to do. And then once we have the functions a a a b one b two uh, defined for the three uh, uh, portions of the, uh, the the entire matrix, and I simply just call spam at and put them onto two three four five. Now in this case uh, I, I I misused the, the labels so that I should really should be uh, two three four five. But for the uh, for illustration uh, purpose, uh, one two three four that's easy to understand. This, in the reality, in, the, in, in Julia, you start a, a process which will have the ID one, and, and everything else will start from a two, three, four, five. Okay, just for illustration of purpose, on the in the diagram on the right hand side, I use the one, two, three, four, five. But just keep me in mind. So by calling spawn add, I I I'm creating the portions of the four uh, por, uh, four blocks of the matrices. And each one of them returns a D, uh, returns the, an object D1, D, uh, D11, D12, and D13, D22. Now, and then I call, I created a distributed matrix by calling D array and I reshape uh, the four blocks and map them on a two by two uh, processor grid. Now, keep in mind, there's a no communication between the main and the worker. I'm calling the function a a b one b two and a uh, uh, by calling a spawn mat. Really, I'm just uh, uh, passing the reference to the to the function, not the not the matrices. And d uh, d one one d one two and so on. These are not matrices. They are handles, futures. And then again, DA, this distributed matrix itself, is not the whole matrix either. It is a reference. It's a reference to the underlying storage. And this will become evidence when we take a look at uh, the next slide. So to examine what's happening and what storage is actually used on each process, we want to use the function called the var info. Var info will give us a list of variables and the storage used on each uh, on, the, on the process. Now remember, uh, you need to always keep in mind where you are. So on the current process, on the main process, you can just simply just call var info because it's local. While on the remote worker processes, you need to dispatch the function to other uh, uh, processes as well. So I'm calling the everywhere and using interactive utils, and the var info is in this module interactive utils. Okay, and you, you load the user you uh, by by loading this uh, modules, you make this module available across all the processors, and then you can just simply just call var info. Because so on the remote host, on the remote, if you want to know. The, uh, uh, the variable list on workers, you would have to dispatch this function var info, which returns a future, and a call fetch to get the result. Okay, now let's take a look at it. So uh, we uh, we created the four uh, futures, and then we'll create a DA, which is the distributed arrays, and let's call the var info on uh, the main uh, process. It shows the DA, DA uh, summary, and the summary column summary is as a two, uh, 200 by 200, because I'm, uh, I'm passing it a 100. So I have a two by two grid, and a two, um, as each block is a 100 by 100 uh, matrix. So, and I will have a 200, uh, on two by two uh, processor grid, I have a 200 by 200 uh, matrix. But the size is a, a 544 bytes. This is so it, this tells you that DA here really is just a reference, and not the not the, the the actual storage. And D11, D12, and so far at the end, as only takes 32 bytes. 
they are future. They are not the actual uh, matrices. Okay. This is the local. Now, if you look at the storage on the worker two, for example, on worker two, now DA also, every worker now has a reference DA, which is the uh, distributed array. Again, it's a two, uh, 200 by 200 uh, 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 distributed array, but it has uh, about 80, uh, 80 megabyte of storage. You can do a math. If you have 100 by 100 matrix, and double position, uh, how many bytes you have? This tells you. This tells you how. This this tells you the the, the size of the distributed array, uh, the, the storage of distributed array on this particular uh, process, worker process. Okay. So var info is very useful to to, allow, to, to give you some insight uh, how the distributed uh, arrays are stored. And okay. Uh, back to uh, this distributed array. So now I have a distributed array DA, and if I want to do a much matrix matrix multiplication, then I can simply just do a DA times DA as if uh, uh, the DA is a, a regular array. So I store the result in DB, and I want to look at what the, the content of a DB is. Then remember the DB. Uh, this is, I want to look at the local part. So I call it db dot the local part. But I want, in particular, I want to examine the, the content on worker three. So by calling a, a spam at worker three, and I want to get this result. And it shows me this is what worker three. This is this part on the right hand side. That's just the lower, uh, lower part of uh, the entire matrix. This is a correct. It shows this is correct. This offering matrix matrix multiplication applied directly on the distributed array does give a, a, a right uh, result. Uh, again, if I refer to, uh, I want to look at in particular a, a, a block of a matrix, uh, matrix, the entire matrix, by referencing the global index. This shows me. This shows me the content. And as a matter of fact, it shows me a view. Okay, it shows me a view. All right. A quick summary. Uh, you need to define a function to be executed on the workers through uh, everywhere, and also you need to define the variables, global variables, and the broadcast to all workers using it everywhere. <clears throat> and uh, you want to create a, a distributed arrays, and you need to call functions on the workers through uh, spawn at or remote calls. Again, these uh, basic operations, you always, always need to dispatch or ship the variables and values to all workers, and always uh, ship the reference or the definition to other uh, workers as well. And then you can perform the operations on distributed arrays as if they, they were local. Okay. And now keep in mind, this is important. This is a very different uh, concept from the single program and multiple data model. Okay. Because it involves uh, dispatching uh, variables and a function. <clears throat> and again, at this point, uh, so far, there's not much uh, uh, self-contained functionality is available yet, but it only allows you to uh, uh, to, to 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 reference the global uh, spaces by indexing uh, to the elements, which is also convenient. And each process has a global view of any distributed objects, and it is a one-sided communication through underlying libraries, for example, the MPI. The other I just want to point out the other prominent programming languages that support global uh, address access so far, the compiled language is Fortran. And support from uh, third party libraries are expected. And there are a couple of uh, packages available, for example, Elemental. And Elemental hides the communication and which allows you to do linear algebra operations on distributed arrays. So, for example, if you have a very, very huge matrix, billions of elements, 
and then you want to find a single value decomposition or single value uh, values, you can simply just call SVD val. But uh, if it tell you that the support for Elemental uh, has been halted and uh, obsolete, and uh, if you want to, if you're interested, you can take a look at. The other options would be a uh, Petsy and uh, and the <coughs> and Turing nodes. And for those who are interested, you can take a look at. Uh, next, uh, we come to a shared arrays. The shared arrays, are similar to a distributed array, in this, uh, except for the shared arrays uh, are stored on the single computer. Okay, it provides you uh, the same community way of accessing data uh, among processes. Okay, so how do you do a shared array? You load the module shared arrays, and then you create an object by calling shared arrays. For example, in this case, I define the integer array of integers, two-dimensional integers, and the size is a five by four. So A becomes a shared array object. So let, let's take a look at the, the example. This example, we, we, we present this example in many of our other, uh, our, uh, many of our courses, Python, uh, MPI, and Fortran. Okay, this uh, again, uh, this in Julia. So this is a one dimensional uh, heat equation, a rod heated in the middle. And the temperature distribution over time can be simulated by the following. So at any point x, the temperature at the next time step t plus delta t will be determined by the temperature at the three neighboring points, right here, left, and the right. Okay, and here k is a parameter; it's a weight. Okay, so this is a model. I, I won't get into the details. Uh, but it, it stems from uh, the Brownian motion and up to uh, uh, a partial differential equations. I won't get into the detail, but this is uh, just take that for, uh, for granted. This is the model for those of you who are not familiar with the, the concept. And then we're using a two dimensional array U, IJ, to store the temperature at a spatial point, first dimension, over time steps, second dimension. So this loop does what it uh, does the uh, the update the cal to calculate the temperature at the next time step across all spatial points going from I1 to IN. Now we want to do this in parallel. The spatial points can be uh, partitioned into P, for example, four worker groups. And the temperatures in each uh, is updated concurrently, independent of other groups. Okay. Uh, just want to point it out that the loop, the loop, the loop over uh, the loop over a spatial point can be replaced by this vector form. This vector, uh, so, so you can see uh, our Python, MATLAB, and the Fortran courses. The, what the solution will look like is shown on the right hand side and the the, <clears throat> the horizontal axis is the x axis is the spatial spatial point and the vertical uh, axis is the value or the temperature and this is this picture is just to show a snapshot at a particular time after actually after 250 uh, time steps okay Now, uh, we have a serial code and parallel code side by side. It's just a sketch. On the, uh, the, because of the concept is very uh, straightforward. On the, on the left hand side, we have the serial code. We have the, we have the serial code and, uh, okay. So we have the serial code and we define the array U, which is two dimensional array. Can, uh, containing uh, the spatial points and the number of time steps, and that the for loop is loop over a uh, loop over uh, time steps. Okay, and that the, the line uh, in yellow highlighted is the vectorized uh, update or evolution 
of time, a temperature in time just for one time step. And the next, the if block, uh, it's just for the, for the output for a display. Uh, I do display every so often, uh, for example, every 10 step and 10 time steps or every uh, uh, single time steps. Okay. So very, uh, very simple, uh, just two lines in the four, uh, two statements in the for loop. First is to update the time temperatures across all spatial points using the vectorized form and then display. The right hand side is the parallel code. The parallel code first I define a shared array, which is a two dimensional double position, uh, two dimensional array, uh, again, uh, containing the, the spatial points, number n and the uh, number of uh, time step, uh, steps and t. And then initialize the, the array u with zero. I put a dot because uh, in Julia, if you want to assign every element uh, to a single value, then you need to put a dot operator in front of uh, the operator. And then I define a function uh, wrapper, a function called update or evolve or evolution, whatever you can call it. This function just does a one time step. First, it calculate the, the start index. If you look at this diagram on the left hand side, uh, on the process on, on worker P, I have a local point. I have a one to MP local point. And I have the global index I1 to IN. So I need to calculate the start index. This is a global index. Uh, and I'll skip the, the boundary point. If, I, if I'm the very first one, I just skip the, the boundary point. And again, if I'm the very last one on the, on the rod, I skip the boundary point again, so that's why. And then at the, uh, at the end of the function, it, it just simply, again, it's a vectorized uh, time update, a vectorized update for one time step. But this update is happening only on a subset of a, uh, spatial points going from I1 to, to IN. Okay. Uh, again, uh, left hand side <coughs> is the serial code, and the right hand side, once we have the function defined, we have the function. Remember, we only have the function defined. If I go back, this is only a function. This function does only one time step. And then uh, for the parallel code, we need to put that into uh, the, put it into the loop over time. So we have the for loop over time, and uh, now we have put the begin and end, I think, at the beginning, I'll explain that why. I put us a for loop here. The for loop, now the for loop is loop over workers. And within the for loop, within, for each worker, I'm gonna call the time update. Remember, this is a remote call. Everything start from a main. You have to keep in mind when you write a code. So I need I need to dispatch this to to worker, and with uh, arguments UKP to be passed to update. Remember the uh, the function update. The update takes uh, three arguments U, which is a reference to the shared uh, array, and then a K. That's a time step and the P, which is the, uh, the processor or worker ID. <clears throat> so I need, uh, I need to dispatch this to, to worker P, uh, P plus one. The reason with P plus one is, uh, remember uh, the, uh, the ID of a worker is going from two to whatever, because the first one is always the one you started originally. So I put async here, which means uh, the execution of the time update on temperature on the, on the, uh, on the workers, the order doesn't matter. So I put in, uh, uh, asynchronous. And also, uh, uh, remember the remote call is, is not blocking. You place this call, it will return immediately. You will not wait until this is finished. And then you go to the next worker and next worker. That will become a serial. 
So remote call is not blocking. You place the call, it, it, it returns immediately. <clears throat> so basically, it's just a shoot uh, uh, the number of uh, remote calls to the workers, and then that's all this for loop uh, uh, does. And then you need to put the sync. sync. This is the time you need to wait. You need to wait until every worker uh, finishes the, the update of the temperature. So that's why you put a sync here. Sync uh, places a wait or synchronization point. Uh, I put the sync begin and, 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 end, uh, uh, and end just in case you, if you have a multiple statements, you can use this end begin, begin and end block. If uh, in, in this case it's just a for loop, I can simply just put the sync uh, in front of a for. That, that's it. If you put a sync in front of a for, it means there's a for loop, the inside the loop that's asynchronous, but the uh, in order uh, uh, the, the the result of each of the uh, uh, the statements inside the loop would have to be uh, synchronized uh, before you move on to the next uh, iteration. Okay, so that's the parallel code. Okay, a quick summary. Uh, shared arrays are for the local computer only. Keep in mind, this is very uh, important. It, it doesn't go beyond the boundary. But a Fortran, I want to point out that Fortran co-array can, uh, can be across nodes. And the shared arrays can be uh, accessed through a global index. Therefore, it's convenient for parallel algorithm. algorithm. And for uh, this uh, 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 object, you will create an object A. The data is not, this is important, the data is shared, but the A is not. A is a reference. This is an important concept. When you create a shared array, the underlying data, the underlying data is shared among processes. But that the reference, the A, is still local. You, in order to be able to access the underlying data on each worker, you still have to, you still have to have that the reference A available. How how to make that uh, uh, reference uh, available? You need to call, for example, everywhere uh, or everywhere in crew that you just basically load that function uh, on every work, uh, worker. That will be fine, or place a remote call. And again, the math and the linear algebra operations applies to shared uh, objects uh, as regular uh, one arrays as well. And then lastly, this diffusion example can also be implemented using distributed array. So it can be run on the cluster. Threads. I'll just uh, briefly mention the thread uh, support in, in Julia. Now, Julia support, uh, so far, the, the, threat, uh, the support for, Julia, uh, for threads is still limited. I just give you two examples here. And the parallel loop, and first we start uh, Julia uh, with the four threads, okay? You call thread inside Julia, you call, uh, you, you load the base of threads. You call thread ID, that should be one. The thread ID, that's, a cur that's the current thread ID. And n thread, that should be four, that returns the number of the threads. And if you put the, Add the thread in front of a four. So what's happening is it divides the for loop iterations into uh, 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 chunks, and uh, and each thread will take uh, a portion. But this is what's happening. The results uh, the, re uh, the results are shown on the right hand side. Now there's no guarantee that every thread will have the equal uh, amount of a job uh, work. Okay, so what's happening here? Again, uh, I'll put a thread in, uh, in front of a for loop, and inside this for loop, I'm doing nothing but just to store the thread ID into, uh, into an array element, and then at display. As you can see, uh, thread one and two both <coughs> uh, present three times, and the three and the four only two times. Okay. And the next example, we create a, a number of threads and have each thread do some work in the function. This is what I intended to do. So I load the, fun uh, uh, load the module threads 
and uh, I call number of threads to see if I do have uh, four threads. And then I write a function, uh, uh, do something, okay? And inside do something, I simply just show the thread ID. And then I put the thread in the for loop. Now this for loop doesn't have a, a variable. I just put underscore. This for loop will loop over one to number of n threads. In this case, it's a four. So I would expect this will be uh, each thread will take one. And as a result, yes. But as you can see, the order uh, is unpredictable. Okay. Now, the um, uh, most important thing is that Julia seems to only allows you to create threads up to the number of available physical cores. So in my case, my uh, computer has only four cores. So I set to export the Julia number threads to four. If I set to eight, and then inside Julia, if I call n threads, it still shows four. Okay, it will ignore. A uh, quick summary. And so far, the threads module in Julia is still experimental, and the number of the threads can be created seems to be uh, limited by the physically available cores, and there doesn't seem to be a way of creating more threads on demand. So far. Uh, we will have a separate talk just dedicated to uh, a Julia uh, multi-threading and programming. And for the latest development, I point the audience to see uh, this article. Uh, next, running a Julia on Compute Canada systems. I, I'm just going to do a quick, uh, quick demo. Okay, so uh, here I have already logged into a uh, uh, grant. And I go to a folder. I want to go to uh, load module GCC. You need to load module GCC.3. Oops, uh, let me see. Module list. Uh, okay, so do a module load GCC 7.3. And then load the module uh, Julia. And the module list, so module list. Now you will see I have a GCC 7.3 and the Julia 1.3 listed, uh, uh, loaded. So next, I'm going to show you an example. <clears throat> uh, I do have a Julia code, which is a hello Julia. Uh, this one does nothing, uh, but just uh, it, <coughs> it it just goes to uh, to fetch the ID and the process ID, Julia ID, process ID, and uh, and host name from uh, participating uh, Julia uh, processes. So I place <coughs> I put a loop here and loop over all the workers, loop over all the workers. Okay, and uh, this call spam at i i here is uh, is the the, now, the the ID of the worker, and it returns the future, and uh, I call the fetch on the future that will return me uh, three numbers. Now, just like a MATLAB, uh, Julia can return multiple uh, objects. Okay, and then I'll just print. The work ID, uh, process ID, and the host and the host host ID. At the beginning of the uh, the code, I, I load the distributed uh, distributed module. The number of uh, workers is not set inside my Julia code. The number of workers will be set. The number of workers will be set when I submit a job when I start a Julia. Now, keep in mind. You never ever set number of workers, create increase number of workers inside Julia because that will cause problem uh, to the schedule in general. That should be avoided. And as well, you should never uh, create a thread uh, inside the inside the Julia. Okay, you should always set ahead of time. Okay, so this is a, a simple Julia code. Load the distributed module. Display. 
display the number of uh, participating uh, 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 display the number of processes, Julia processes, and display the number of uh, workers. And then in the loop, I dispatch the call to my ID, get, get a PID, and get the host name and uh, on, on worker I to the number of workers and dis display the result. Okay. At the end, I just remove the workers, uh, workers uh, because this is um, the end of the, the program. If you don't even do this, then the end, once your program finishes, your job finishes, then the scheduler will kill everything. So that's fine. But in general, you should have, you should obviously have a graceful uh, termination. Okay. And I then I have a, a run script, Julia. Inside this uh, run a script, I define the number of uh, multiple processes to be a uh, 64. So I want to demonstrate that I do. I can uh, I can uh, run a, a Julia across nodes because each node has only 32 uh, processes. By uh, by using a more than 32, then for sure that my Julia process, it will land on other uh, nodes as well. And uh, this is the same as an MPI, okay. Uh, everything also is the same as MPI. And uh, the job name, I just give a name, hello, and output, uh, go to hello.log, and the billing account, or the, the account groups, I am, and the runtime, that's a five, five minutes, uh, that's more than enough, five minutes, okay. The, the format is is a day dash hour minute. If the day is missing, you can simply just put the hour and the column minute. Okay. And um, the memory per CPU in this case I set to one gig, but the default is uh, default is four gig. But in this case, it, it's way more than enough for this this program. This program uh, simply just uses quite a few uh, processors, uh, uh, cores, sixty four in this case. Now, pay attention to the last three lines. I use the call S1 host name to generate a host file. This host file will be used by Julia. This is similar to MPI. Julia, uh, starting the multi-process Julia job is similar to MPI, but it's, uh, the scheduler can handle MPI jobs well, but not necessarily Julia because the syntax. So at first I need to build the host file. This host file returned by S1 will just contain the node, contain the nodes, a list of a node uh, uh, allocated. And then I put a steep file. Uh, uh, you don't have to do. And then I use the command Julia dash dash option machine file and the host file and then my Julia code. So using the option machine file and host file to define the not, to define where to run <clears throat> and run the Julia code. Okay. Uh, so I do uh, S batch and I simply just do run Julia. And that's Q. Uh, see myself. Oh, it's already done. Oh no. It, it shows it's it's running. It's running, and uh, clear it shows my job is being uh, distributed distributed to uh, different nodes. Sixty uh, forty six. Uh, 47, 48, 52, uh, 60, 75. Okay, so it is truly distributed across nodes. So the job is done. Uh, let's take a look at the results. So I have, uh, okay, job's done. Oops, the host files. So these are the host files, and I should have the output somewhere. Uh, it's not there yet. Uh, 
Oh, it, it, well, it, it's still running. Okay. I think I should uh, I just stop here. Uh, let's still wait. And I'm taking a, a question from the audience while waiting for the results. <laughs>